Um, these handheld mics work, can I? Yep. Fantastic. Um, hi, so my name is Natanya malin -Gazik. Um I work with all different kinds of companies and organizations on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you see the logos on here, the organizations that I've worked with range quite a bit. I do work quite a bit with uh, early stage and mid-sized tech startups. Um, so have some familiar familiarity working with engineers. Um, the thing that all of these organizations have in common is uh, very strong and often, I would call them beautiful, uh, intentions or values around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and some curiosity about where they might be hitting the mark or missing the mark in terms of living those values every day. So I come in and help organizations figure out where they're hitting the mark and where they could be, uh, where there's like maybe some room to grow, and then bridge that gap together. So what are we gonna talk about today? For the next 20, 25 minutes or so, um, I'm hoping to answer, or start to answer at least two questions for you. Um, the first is, what are we talking about when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? We'll go through some basic vocabulary words together that hopefully will help us be able to have these conversations a little bit more productively together and in our offices. And the second is, what can I do about it? So when you leave this room, when you get back to work on Monday, what are some things that you can actually do in your organizations to help your organizations live their values? So let's jump in. Let's talk about some vocabulary words. I think when we hear vocabulary words, sometimes we think about vocabulary tests. There will be no quiz at the end of this conversation. And I'm actually not particularly concerned about whether you memorize definitions to these words. I'm really interested in you walking away with an understanding of how these words are related to one another and why it's important to look at them uh, in combination and not in isolation. So let's think about the relationships between the words and not necessarily focus on making sure we memorize the exact definitions of the words themselves. I like to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a dance party. So diversity, inviting somebody to come to the dance. Inclusion, actually asking them to dance with you once they're there. These are outcomes. You either have lots of different kinds of people at the dance or you don't. You either have lots of different kinds of people dancing at the dance or you don't. Equity are the processes, not the outcomes, that we use to actually make sure people are able to get to the dance, that people are actually able to dance once they're there and feel comfortable doing so. So equity is thinking about things like, does somebody have a ride to get there in the first place? Is there music playing that not only makes people not uncomfortable, but actually makes them excited to get on the dance floor? What does the lighting look like? What kind of food is being served? What's the environment? Do people feel comfortable there so that they can feel included? Let's jump into what that actually means at work. When we talk about diversity, we're usually talking about demographics when we talk about our staff. Is there the presence of difference inside of our organizations? I want to take a pause there and think about the fact that diversity actually only exists in relationship to a group. So if you walk away from this talk with just one thing today, I really hope it's that you stop using the term diverse candidate. Usually when we say the term diverse candidate, we actually mean something else. What we might mean is this, this person is a woman. This person is a person of color. This person identifies with the LGBTQ community. If that's what we mean, then that's what we need to say. Being more precise with our language actually helps us achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve. When we're talking about diversity, we're talking about a group of people. And if we're trying to bring more underrepresented folks into our workplaces, let's talk about the groups that, that exist in our workplaces and the groups that don't. So diversity is the presence of difference in a group. I'm diverse only to the extent that I have like a lot of diverse organisms inside of my body. But my femaleness doesn't make me a diverse person, right? That's not a thing. And we're talking about equity. So equity are these processes, right? Equity is the presence of fairness inside an organization and the processes that, and the systems that we implement to try to create a level playing field, which in this field we recognize actually doesn't exist in society at large. And so because people aren't starting from a level playing field, none of us are, it's important to think about the equitable processes that we put in place inside of our organizations to create that sense of fairness. If we do that, then we might start to see a sense of inclusion, where we're actually bringing individuals in as part of a group. We're involving them meaningfully in the processes that we have going on at work and decision making. There's a sharing of power. And we think about that especially when it comes to underrepresented groups who often are less included, even if they are present. And if we put all of these things in place, then individuals might start feeling a sense of belonging at work. This has become kind of a sexy word lately to talk about belonging. Let's think about what it actually means. 
We often feel a sense of belonging when we're part of a homogenous group, when we sense a lot of sameness around us. So if you think about a time when you have felt belonging, it might be with your family, it might be when you've been part of a religious organization or a social club, you know what the sameness is with the people around you. You're not having to put a ton of effort into fitting into cultural norms. When we do, when we feel different from other, the other people around us, we're having to actually spend what turns out to be quite a bit of mental and emotional energy to fit in. And that, at work, takes away from our ability to actually be productive. So what's the point of having a hugely diverse organization if the folks who you've brought in, who are part of underrepresented groups, are having to spend so much of their energy to fit in and to feel like they might kind of sort of maybe belong, that they actually don't have a ton of time left over to put mental energy into their work. That's quite a shame. You'll see I have a, an equation on the side of the screen. This isn't like a perfect mathematical equation, but what it's meant to represent is the fact that we need to have the presence of all of these things. Uh, when we have diversity, we need equity and inclusion in order for everybody to feel that sense of belonging. What you will notice, though, is that it's quite possible to have diversity without having equity, inclusion, or belonging. It's also quite possible to have a sense of belonging or a sense of inclusion without any diversity at all. That's quite common when you hear, especially in tech, people talk about what an amazing culture their company has, how included they feel at work, um, what a great sense of camaraderie there is among their peers. If you look at the demographics of those organizations, you're often looking at pretty homogenous organizations. Where I get really excited is where we see the achievement of there's tons of diversity here, and we're boasting about our culture, and even folks, especially folks from underrepresented groups, are also boasting about the culture. That's something to pay attention to. So um, that's it for the vocabulary lesson. I hope that gives you enough of a foundation to be able to start thinking about these, um, these concepts a little bit more productively. I'm gonna move on now uh, to what we can actually do about it when we get to work. So, so diversity and inclusion outcomes, equity process. I'm dividing this up into the phases of the employee life cycle, just because it's a little bit of an easier way to think about processes in somewhat of an order. And I'm going to start with selection, so hiring. Um, quick show of hands, raise your hand for me if you're, you're all engineers in tech. So if you have been part of an organization, part of a hiring process, uh, part, uh, part of a, maybe you have been interviewing or you've been thinking about hiring new people and you've heard somebody mention the phrase or you've thought to yourself, we'd really like more diversity inside of this organization, we'd like to hire more women, more people of color, fill in the blank, but there are, we're not finding enough qualified candidates in our field. We don't have enough uh, folks in engineering with these identities. If you heard that comment, if you thought it yourself, yeah. Um, so this is something that a lot of my clients come to me with. Um, and I will tell you a little bit of a story uh, about what I have done to help with that and the kinds of things that you might bring up to your organizations next time you hear that. I'm throwing a bunch of tactics on the slide for you. you I'm not gonna walk you through each of these. It would be a little bit boring. Please feel free to write them down and Google them. Um, you'll, you should find tons of information about each of these. I'm gonna walk you through an example instead, hopefully a little bit more interesting. I had a client come to me last year, early stage tech startup, hiring engineers. Actually, um, fluency in Postgres was a, a very important criteria for those engineers. Um, and uh, what they were saying to me was, Natanya, diversity is a core value for us. We, we mean that, we live it, it's really important. And our engineering team is entirely male. And that, like visually, is not a representation of what our values are, and also it doesn't feel right to us. Can you please help us find more qualified female engineers? And I said, I'm, I would be happy to try to help you with that, but actually we, what we need to figure out is why you're having this problem in the first place and why it is that this is the, this is the um, hypothesis that you've developed is that you don't have enough women on your engineering team because there aren't enough qualified female engineers. Certainly that's true. There are great programs like Girls Who Code who are working to bring more women into the field, but there are, there are quite a few women in this field, so why aren't they applying to your roles and why aren't you hiring them? The first thing that we did was think about their networking. So it turns out that we tend to hire from the groups that we know. When we're working in tech, we're often in fast-growing organizations, we need to hire somebody yesterday, and so we reach out to our networks. And because we're human beings, we tend to network with people who look like us, who think like us, who have things in common with us, 
That doesn't make us evil people. That's really, really normal. But what that means is that we need to have some awareness of that and start building our networks a little bit more thoughtfully. So I help this organization build relationships with organizations where women in tech tend to gather. Organizations like Women Who Code, where we can post not only post our job descriptions on their site, but also ask them, what does meaningful partnership look like for you? What do you need right now? How can we build a relationship for the long term so that the next time we need more engineers, we already have that existing relationship, and the thing that we can do in a hurry is actually reach out to the people we know, who are you, and start seeing uh, who you have in the organization who we can hire. So thoughtful networking. We then looked at their job description. So there's great platforms out there. Textio is one of my favorites. They've got a nice free trial if you want to pop in there today. Um, Textio and other platforms like it allow you to put your job descriptions um, in a website, and it pops up for you, shows you what language you might be using that might actually be attracting um, candidates with certain demographics. So in particular for this organization, we looked at language that might be more attractive to male candidates instead of female candidates. Um, that's a, a really nice and simple way, pretty straightforward, to help make sure that our job descriptions are not part of the problem. Uh, blind resume reviews, so we took names off of resumes, we took names of schools off of resumes. This is a great way to make sure that our unconscious biases, which is a whole other workshop, um, aren't playing a bigger role in our candidate selection process than we would like them to when we're thinking with our sound and calm minds. And then structured interviews is the biggest piece of this. So what a structured interview does is make sure that we're assessing every candidate in the same way every time. This is really important because it turns out that as human beings, we have different comfort levels with of different kinds of human beings. Really normal, doesn't make us bad people, it's just part of being human. And when we have a structured interview process, what we're doing is making sure that the unconscious biases that play a role in that comfort level aren't what's dictating who we're bringing into our organization and who we're not. So we look at the business objectives for an organization, take a lot of steps to end, end up determining what questions we're gonna ask in the interview and um, how we're assessing a candidate the same way every time based on their answers to those questions. Um, we then talked about eliminating negotiations. So what I worked with them in the offer extension process. It turns out um, that eliminating negotiations is a really excellent way to start uh, chipping away at the pay equity gap between men and women. And one of the challenges that they were having was that they actually had extended some offers to women and they declined. And so we needed to figure out ways to signal to those women, hey, even though you don't see any other women on this engineering team, we are taking meaningful steps to make sure we have equitable processes in the organization. And so that's one of them. We, had, we went through all of those steps um, and we did see more women start to come through and make more progress uh, in, the, in the candidate selection process, and we still saw some women um, declining the offers. And so what we did then was move on to thinking about why might they be doing that? Well, they might be um, picking up on some things that give them some hints at what the environment might be like inside the organization. It's also very normal to not want to join a group where we have a visual signal that we might be the only one inside of that group. That means we're gonna have to spend a lot of mental and emotional energy once we get into that organization doing things that aren't what we're being paid to do or, or what we're gonna be evaluated based on. Oops. I'm gonna walk you through an exercise if someone can come up and help me. Oh, there we go, perfect. Um, so uh, we then moved on to looking at retention and promotion practices, we'll, which we'll look at next. But before we do that, uh, how much time do I have left? Perfect. Um, I would love to have us just start thinking about how we might implement some of these um, kinds of practices in our own organizations. Um, so if you could take uh, maybe two minutes with the person next to you or in front of you, depending on where you're sitting, and start thinking about what you would do in this scenario. So you've just started, you've gone out and started, founded your own company, congratulations, it's really successful, you're growing fast and you've gotta hire some more engineers. Um, and you're growing, you know, you're tiny. So it might be actually pretty, this is the stage where it might be easy for you to just hire who you know, right? But think about it, you're setting the groundwork for what you're gonna look like a couple of years down the road. So I'd love for you to start thinking about what are the things that would actually be reasonable for you to expect yourself to do today to start um, building a diverse, to make sure that you can build a diverse team as you grow. So just take a couple of minutes and talk with your neighbor about what things that you might do.
from same organization Fantastic. and actually we think that our organization is a perfect example because it was started like just recently and our CEO who is a female actually <laughs> made sure that from the very beginning it is built uh, with diversity in mind and a lot of things she like put down there because I was like the employee number six in the company <laughs> so I've uh, seen through all this process um, so uh, actually one of the big things she did from day one again, she um, was explicitly focusing on benefits for parents and uh, she we, we have some unique benefits actually I think nobody has in addition of like uh, giving very generous like parental leave and most importantly actually she um, made sure that we are giving actually parental leave so regardless whether it's mother or father mm -hmm. they gave get like same benefits and one of the best things we just got uh back to work like how called is is back to work right that's how it's called. So like that. yeah so um after the maternity paternity leave we have also another four weeks when uh they come on short week three times a day on full pay so, so I, I yes that's, that's fantastic that's so that's flexible that's schedules and parental leave benefits yeah. are actually that's perfect segue thank you not even planned um, into <laughs> the next um section which is Talking about, oh, just kidding. Um, talking about, oh, I'll tell you what you're, what's covered up, uh, retaining and promoting diverse talent. So when we think about um, the kinds of practices that we put in place, going back to this previous example where we were bringing women through the pipeline and they were rejecting our offers, thinking about why might that be the case? So one way to answer that question is actually ask them, and one of the things that we did was um, implement 
um, surveys for Kansas who've gone through our hiring process regardless of the outcome. Um, but one of the things that we were learning um, was that we weren't doing a particularly good job of advertising or sharing with candidates concrete examples of the kinds of equitable processes that we had in place. Um, so here on the screen, uh, I'll tell you what's covered up. So the, the first one says um, specific and um, uh, productive, uh, constructive <coughs> feedback. So when we give feedback, we're giving it about a specific incident that happened. We can describe the behavior that took place. And then um, we're being constructive about what we are asking the person to do. Um, one of the things that we know in tech in, in particular is that when women receive feedback, it tends to be vague. Um, it's not necessarily about a specific incident that happened, but it's about like, well, you're, you're, you're just showing up in kind of a funny way. I'm not quite sure. I feel like you could be more X. If we can be specific and constructive, we're actually helping somebody's career quite a bit more. The other thing that's covered up says um, pay equity and transparency. Uh, the other thing that's covered up says um, sharing office housework. Um, so the first column here is really about the kinds of feedback that we give to employees and how. Um, when we think about retention and promotion, we want to make sure that we are evaluating people in a fair way. One of the ways that we can do that is the kind of feedback that I just described, specific and constructive. Another way we can do that is 360 reviews, so making sure that when we're evaluating somebody, we're taking a lot of different perspectives into account. If we care about how people treat their subordinates, then we've got to ask their subordinates about how they're doing it. And then making sure that we take that into account when we're thinking about promotions and we have a really clear ladder that's transparent for everybody to understand how you can move from point A to point B. Promotion criteria is also a really great way for an organization to live their values um, when it comes to making sure that we're promoting leaders who are actively supporting our values. So there are companies out there who refuse to give an employee their bonus or promote them if they have been a manager unless, as a manager, they have managed to, they have, um, they have accomplished uh, uh, making their team more diverse as it has grown. If they haven't been able to do that, they can't get their bonus that year. So that's a way for an organization to really say, we're putting our money where our mouth is, we're, uh, or we might look at a, a, a manager's engagement scores to think about, um, is there a huge different differential on their team in terms of employees with different demographics, uh, experiencing engagement differently in the organization. So really making sure we're evaluating folks fairly and then holding ourselves accountable to that as an organization. Um, amplification is one on here that I think I should explain because we don't hear it a ton. Um, a quick Google with the word amplification in Obama, White House, and women will take you a really fun story that I'll summarize for you quickly. Um, you would hope that a president uh, with Barack Obama's values would have uh, be the leader of an organization, the White House, um, that was quite equitable and inclusive, particularly as a black man. Um, but it turns out that our identity and our values don't actually necessarily mean that we have the practices in place to create the kind of inclusion that we want. And it turns out that the women who worked on Barack Obama's staff were noticing that something was happening inside the White House that's really common for women to experience in any organization, which is that at large meetings, a woman would speak up, share an idea, the conversation would move on. Nobody would really recognize the idea. A man would share the same idea a couple of comments later, and all of a sudden it was a fantastic idea and everybody was talking about it. And the women were fed up, and so they decided to um, become allies for each other and engage in a process that we now call amplification, which means that as soon as a woman shared an idea that another woman at the table thought was interesting, the other woman would jump in immediately and say, gosh, Natanya, I love that idea. What I heard you just say was, I think women should support each other in the workplace by doing X, Y, and Z, and make sure that everybody around the table had an opportunity to actually hear that idea twice. Um, this is something that men could do too, except that then we bring in the complicated dynamic of the man getting credit, so it actually worked quite well for women to do it for each other. But this is an example of something that you don't need to be a manager to do, right? There are tons of grassroots efforts that we can engage in to create more equitable processes inside of our organizations. Um, and I'd encourage, I think, sharing office housework um, is also something that we think about when we're thinking about um, women in tech in particular. Office housework is things like who remembers birthdays, who plans office outings, who takes the notes during meetings. These are things that we see women tend to do a lot more than men on average. And so when we can put in processes and systems to make sure that we have ways for dividing that work, what we're doing is making sure that everybody has an equal amount of time to put into the work that they're actually getting evaluated based on and that we decide to give promotions based on. 
one of the reasons why it's important to engage in systems and processes like these is because, especially in tech, but across all uh, most industries in the US, we see lots of demographic diversity entry levels, right? We've actually done, like law is a great example of this, right? We see 50-50 um, parity in, uh, in, in gender in the entry levels of the law field. And then we see that the vast majority of equity partners in law firms are men. They're also majority white. What's happening? Why are we not seeing people get promoted at equal rates? Because a lot of these processes are in place. People are, are welcomed into organizations and then have to spend a lot of their time and energy fitting into cultural norms that aren't theirs. We're not actually uh, including them in the culture in meaningful ways, giving underrepresented folks time to commit to the activities that we're then evaluating them on and giving them promotions on, and then we're not, uh, we're not seeing them rise in the ranks. So one quick last exercise. Um, Let's say you're a manager of a team of 12 or so engineers, and your boss comes to you with an opportunity and says, I would love for you to nominate one person on your team to uh, join a leadership development program. So this could be any kind of program where this is an opportunity for somebody to develop leadership skills. It's going to be a big boost in their career and really set them on a management track. Turn to your neighbor and chat for the next 45 seconds or so. What factors are you going to use in, in determining who to nominate? How are you going to figure out who to nominate? Asking your employees on a regular basis, how's it going? 
what, what are the things that we could be doing as an organization to make sure that you feel a greater sense of inclusion and belonging at work? When we make these surveys confidential and anonymous, so we have a better chance of actually receiving feedback that's going to help us improve as an organization, make sure folks are actually having an opportunity to shine, and course correcting as we go. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect at how I implement this stuff. I run these surveys all the time to make sure I figure out where are my blind spots, what have I not told this organization to do that I should be telling them to do. I don't know unless I ask, and neither do you. So really important point. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Okay. Well, hopefully the panel is great food for thought. I'm going to pass it off to them. You're going to be hearing from a couple of different folks who think about these issues every day in their organization, um, and hearing from examples uh, uh, from them about what it looks like to actually implement some of these equitable processes at work. I would love to stay in touch with you and continue the conversation, so please feel free to reach out if I can answer any questions, and I'll also stick around after the panel as well. Thank you so much.